Aloha everyone. Welcome back to another episode for the Sacred Sexuality series. Today I have the lovely Miss Mitcha Langstrom from Tantric Frequency um, here with me today. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you for your time and for being on the show with us, Mitcha, and welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Angel. It's an honor and thank you so much for offering the opportunity. Yeah, I'm really grateful to be able to connect with these just incredible human beings like yourself from around the world who have been pioneering in these controversial, very sensitive subjects that are so needed on the planet right now. Um, so I'm really grateful to have you here. And I just want to, I just want to make sure I know that your tantric frequency on Instagram is that what you, is your website? I can't remember. It was at Nitya. Langstrom.com or what's your website? Authenticity Coaching is my business name. Authenticity, yeah. authenticity, authenticity coaching. coaching. Yeah, that's my business name and that's my website. Okay. Yeah. Authenticity Coaching yeah. and Tantric Frequency on Instagram. On Instagram, yeah. Beautiful. And you're tuning in from Australia, is that correct? Yeah, Australia's East Coast. Lovely, lovely. Okay, so I would love just to get this started by asking you to share a little bit about your personal journey and how you came to this work. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, look, it started actually many years ago for me. Um, we're looking at like three decades ago when I was very mm -hmm. young and uh, uh, really looking to find answers for myself. I had been through a hard time in my late teens uh, with different, um, I had food addiction and I just was really deeply looking for answers in my life. And I ended up going to India to stay in a um, commune in India in the early 1990s. Um, and uh, that's where the journey really sort of took off for me because I felt like I met the kind of people that I could resonate with and I wanted to mm -hmm. find out more about what it was that they were discovering. So I lived in between the spiritual commune in India and uh, a similar commune in Italy mm -hmm. for a few years in the early 1990s and they were very sort of formative years for me because I was young and um, and uh, I got exposed to a lot of you know alternative practices, a lot of meditation. Um, I did some tantra training back then as well, and uh, lots of other sort of new age related things. Mm -hmm. And I think most importantly for me during those years was when I met a lover. Uh, that I was in a relationship with for three years. He was 15 years older than me and, um, and naturally I'd say very tantric man. He was a yogi and a meditator and um, and uh, we were deeply in love for a few years. Um, we lived in each other's pockets and uh, and I got exposed to uh, Tantra in a way that was a very direct experience and at the time maybe I kind of didn't realize as much as I did years afterwards what I actually had been through mm. and that's when I then started looking for more answers and, and self studies. I've, I've read um, Barry Long, um, Diana Richardson who I later got to meet in person actually, she became a personal friend as well which was amazing and um, really a lot of self-studies over the years as I explored um, and tried to make sense of what I had experienced with this man because I noticed later on that um, other lovers weren't necessarily on the same wavelength whereas yeah. with this man it had been so easy and so natural uh, the way we connected intimately mm -hmm. uh, that was um, it's really sort of set the foundation for me that you can't go backwards kind of yeah. afterwards you know you can't forget it once you experience that and I think everyone we have that recognition recognition once mm -hmm. we experience and understand something you can't undo it yeah so that sort of took me on a journey of understanding like but what was that and how come for this other guys I were with they kind of could not grasp that you know and so to clarify 
with the with the sort of other lovers, it was very much focused on orgasm and and getting somewhere. It was this kind of hot, passionate sex that would last not for very long, maybe you know, maybe twenty minutes if you were lucky, you know. Mm -hmm. And and then it was like, oh, how was it for you? Kind of, and I was like, kind of perplexed, like. Is this the way it kind of is, you know? Because I used to make love for hours and, and sometimes seemingly almost days with this other man where it was so natural and effortless and you never counted the times you have sex because that sort of didn't enter. It was this timelessness that you yeah. connect in. And it's not a focus on reaching anywhere, but it's like the 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 opening is in the moment. It's like in every moment there's a portal to this infinite space and that's where it all happens, you know, there's no goal to reach to. So that was my early experiences and then it took me years to kind of make sense of that. Yeah. And, 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 um, and that's sort of been the journey over the years and I've done lots of other things as well. I've been into art and, uh, and gardening and I had three kids. So it wasn't always it wasn't always about tantra, but in the later years now, uh, seven years ago, I trained as a coach, and that's when I finally got to the point of deciding that I want to use the experiences I've had and put this into some kind of work to help the men who still have not been mm -hmm. shown this, you know, because it is still not readily available in the mainstream approach. So most mm -hmm. guys still don't kind of understand what it's about and women as well. What but I like? choose to work with the men because in my area, there's actually a lot of women's work. Yeah. So my choice was like, well, I want to do something for the men. So yeah, yeah that's, that's a long story. <laughs> in short. That was perfect and beautiful. And so many points that I would love to comment on. And I just want to say that that's one of the things about you that has stood out to me because I don't see women mentoring men with about their sexual energy. And I love that you're doing it because it is such a huge uh, part of our lives. And it's so hugely dysfunctional right now. There's just not enough education about it. And there's so many things that can come in and just totally like really mess with guys because they're, you know, they're highly sexually charged just by themselves. Like, and then when you add something like porn into it and, and when they get exposed to it at a young age, when their brains are still developing and they're already so, you know, sexual, just, being men, it's like, it just seems like such a monumental task in my mind to unravel all of that yeah. distortion, if you will, that's been created around it. And there's so, I just feel like it's just one of the hugest areas on the entire planet that needs help. So I'm so grateful that you have chosen to answer the calling to serve in that area because it's big and there's not enough people that are in an embodied state of wisdom who can actually genuinely guide, not just from textbooks, you know? Um, yeah. So it's well, thank you. Thank you. And yes, it is enormous. And it's, I think, you know, everyone who feels drawn to this, I mean, we are needed, you know, because there's so many different angles that you can approach this on as well you know and and it hasn't been easy to to be woman working with men necessarily i think um mm -hmm. even though in, yeah i mean it's like you're half of the pictures like you can if if you're a man or a woman you you know ideally i would be both <laughs> in a way but i think um yeah bringing this perspective from a feminine point of view i think is really important and uh um I love working with the men that find me, you know, it's not for everyone, you know, some guys are drawn to work with men, for sure, you know, but um, yeah, it's been, it's been an amazing journey, and there's so much to do when you're saying, like, in regards to the whole porn, the whole porn culture, you know, and um, 
yeah look thank you for creating this opportunity because there's not enough platforms for this kind of work to be exposed looking at censorship on you know on the yes. main platforms it's you can't say this you can't say that and there's shadow banning and, and all sorts of things you know so um thank you you know for putting this together and bringing the people together from the all corners of the world yeah it's such an honor for me honestly i just absolutely love the hour that i get with every single one of you it's truly such a rewarding experience for me and i know the audience feels the same way so the love is mutual between all of us <laughs> Um, so I wanted to just circle back to the very beginning of your journey that you were talking about because you said that you had uh, like eating disorder issues early, earlier on in your life. And I actually was just talking with my partner about this this morning about how I, I personally believe that human beings are meant to be in in a like low level of arousal and tapped into more enjoyment and pleasure just naturally I feel like that's supposed to be our natural state of being and I personally see that everybody is you know consciously or unconsciously reaching for something that's gonna try and like help help them feel that natural state of being of enjoyment and pleasure that we all know on a soul level deep down is our birthright mm -hmm. to experience. And I, I personally feel like that's a huge reason why food addictions and um, issues with food come about because we're like trying to fill that void where we know we're supposed to be, you know, feeling more enjoyment and pleasure in our life, but we don't know how to. And there's so much in the world that's been um that that keeps us from tapping into that yeah would you agree yeah absolutely and i mean there's so many ways of expressing and experiencing joy and pleasure that are somehow subtly subtly condemned yeah you know it's like when little children you know are so free and natural in their expression and but very soon we learn to to control and restrict ourselves, like sit properly, walk properly, don't do that, you're too wild, you're too much, you're too loud, you know, yep. too sensual. I mean, you know, the guys are told very early on that they're not allowed to be sensual, for example, and, and little boys and little girls are equally, you know, sensual and sensitive. Yeah. And, uh, and yet we are so conditioned against that, so we hold it all in, and then the only few ways that we can experience pleasure might be through food then or, or something like watching something like you know watching porn you know yeah. projecting your 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 incredible you know energy onto a screen onto something that's not even here rather than living that for ourselves in our own life so so yeah it's a lot about reclaiming our right to actually fully be here and fully experience this you know life in in all its possible you know infinite ways of experiencing joy and pleasure and and reclaiming those areas that have been condemned i mean so that's why for me everything that has to do with the whole body is so important it's not just sexuality it's enjoying the whole body you know every part of the body is, is capable of experiencing pleasure and joy when we allow ourselves to use it but most people have shut themselves down so much that we have numbness and we have restrictions and we don't even feel, you know, we're disconnected from our feelings because we condemned emotions. We're only allowed to feel certain emotions, but not others. And we, if you, we suppress some emotions, then we also suppress the good emotions that we want to experience. So everything becomes this kind of, you know, flat line, you know, and that's kind of, yeah, quite intense when you look at that's what we come to in many ways you know absolutely yeah yes and um if you don't mind me asking you said you had three three children right yeah so i would love to hear a little bit about how that's been for you to raise them with your own with the awareness that you have about sexual energy like yeah you must have known not to like shame them mm -hmm. when, when they start experiencing 
you know, like sensation and emotion as they're growing up, like, how is that for you as a parent to be raising children on a more conscious level when it comes to sexuality? What's that been like for you? Uh, look, it's been an amazing journey. You know, I was, I knew from the beginning that I wanted to be home with my kids. I wanted to spend time with them and allow them to be as free as possible. I mean, that's why I'm also really happy to be raising kids where I live because mm. we literally live in paradise here. It's summer, you know, kind of summer all year round. You know, they could always run around naked and happy <laughs> free, you know, all those things, you know. So that's been great. And, um, Look, it's kind of, I don't even know if it was, from from an early place, um, I think it was just natural the way I just wanted them to be free and, and be able to be themselves and express their emotions and everything, you know. So in, in terms of sexuality, I think I've just always sort of encouraged them, you know, and now they're teenagers and... And I see a lot of the influence that they get from uh, their peers and their school and all the stuff they watch online, which is, you know, the, the mainstream stuff. So we have a lot of conversations, which is really great. I love that. So, you know, I feel that, you know, I've really taken the opportunity to talk with them as much as possible, you know. And there's mm -hmm. been some times when they've been like, Oh, mom, why do you have to be a sex coach? Like, could you <laughs> do something else, you know? But they've slowly come to terms with that. And I think also even, you know, a bit proud and kind of, uh, you know, when they came up their series, the um, sex education came up, you know, that's like, then they could kind of put the pieces into place. Yeah. And they were like, oh, yeah, I get what mom's doing kind of thing, you know? And, and, um, yeah. And yeah, I feel like we're at a really good place, you know, they definitely, you know, have a very open understanding of sexuality and uh, mm -hmm. I've done everything I can really for my end and then there's a limit to what you can do now they're really just, just going to explore for themselves and have their own experiences, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, both with my boy and my two girls, you know, I've really done my best to to let them know that, you know, they really always have a choice to to stop in each moment and evaluate where they're at and really go, is this right for me or is it not? You can always change your mind. You can always go, hang on a moment, you know, this doesn't feel right or something. You never have to do something you don't want. Mm -hmm. You know, you can always um, slow down and, yeah, along those lines, you know, along those lines and then they were just really gonna have to explore for themselves you know and we're not quite there yet so it's still kind of early days but yeah i'm excited for the future and to hear what you know what's going to be their experience yeah. yeah i'm just thinking about how much like healthier of a mind they're going to have as an adult by having you as a mother who understands the importance of raising them free mm -hmm. and without all of that dogma and shame without passing that on like I personally see your children as like a new kind of human on the planet that's not inheriting a lot of the programming mm -hmm. that gets unconsciously passed down through parents they're not receiving that so in my mind they have like a totally new opportunity and energy and ability to perceive the world without as many layers of programming. So it sounds, it just feels like, um, it feels important what you're doing, even though you're just doing it naturally because you're just being a mom. But I see, <laughs> I see the hugeness of this, this just puzzle of, reclamation like you said of reclaiming so many aspects of who we truly are as human beings and it in my eyes always starts with children it always starts with Absolutely. our youth and how we raise them yeah because then they turn into adults and a lot of what you pick up as a child stays with you forever so it's yeah. so important to get the childhood part right because that makes a healthy evolved human right 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I definitely haven't done everything right. You know, I definitely want to add that, you know, like I started as a parent with all the like, oh, I'm going to do all of this, you know, like, you know, sleeping with them, carrying them and, you know, all, all the natural things. But in reality, doesn't always turn out exactly like that. So I feel like I've done a lot of mistakes but I've done my best, you know, and now we're at the point where they kind of will naturally still um, kind of rebel where they're at, you know, and not necessarily thinking what mom does is the amazing thing. They could right. choose to kind of want to do something opposite to what I'm doing. But I know, like you say, that there's definitely a foundation there where I think they've seen enough of something else that they will be able to draw on when they go out in the world now and start to, um, you know, encounter these things i mean i, I love for, as an example for uh, my youngest um, teenage girl had a couple of her friends in the car one day we were driving and i heard them sort of whisper and giggle in the back and they say we got a question you know like because they sort of heard that you know this is the work my daughter's mom does so they were asking something and wanted to find out and it was so gorgeous so heartwarming you know that they trusted me enough to ask me something about boys and sex and you oh. know so so yeah, those kind of things are just yeah, very rewarding to know that they feel that safe to ask these things and that it's, mm -hmm. it has a positive energy around it, you know? So Definitely. open open communication as much as possible. That's yeah, on, on all different, you know, topics as they enter adulthood slowly, slowly. Yes, definitely. I feel like the communication is key and I honestly feel like you can talk to your children like, like I feel like they can handle more oftentimes. They like, if you talk to them about like openly about things, even at a young age, I feel like they're kind of going to get some of it as opposed to just babying them. Like, I feel like it, it really helps them to like, look at them as little divine creators who, you know, like get the world and and don't just like goo goo gaga -ga baby them for their whole lives, like see the divinity in them and share information with them as they grow. Yeah. And even if they're like not really getting and like loving what you do, I absolutely know that when they're all full grown adults, they are gonna be so grateful that you are who you are and you do what you do. Once they have really matured, they're just gonna really understand a lot more how blessed they are to have you as a mother <laughs> well thank you yeah that's that's definitely my hope as well and, and it's and we get at a good point at this point in time that's for sure you know and I feel that it's through this young generation as well that this can best spread in yes. a way you know the young people that talk to each other and and see more people and and um, because it's um yeah the earlier they can you know get exposed to you know a different way of mm -hmm. living their sexuality the better you know so i love it when you know i work with with young clients you know because it's like wow they have a life ahead of them you know that's taking on a new trajectory you know it's just yeah, yeah. definitely mm -hmm. i absolutely love when i get around some youth and they're open and I can share some things with them because they don't have quite as much conditioning as adults do yet. So it like they get it faster. You know what I mean? There's Absolutely. Just... You know, which is amazing. Yeah. The younger Definitely. generation, they, they at a different level already in some ways. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, if I'm not mistaken, when you were in India, did you stay around you got to like experience Osho's world and community is that correct yeah. I would love to hear about that yeah. he sounds like a very special being yeah and yeah look yeah tell me his concept of I just I know that like uh I know that everything that he stood for is highly controversial, but I also personally believe that he just helped obliterate so much of the conditioning that we get from the culture that doesn't actually serve us. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's so great that you've actually got to experience um, in real time, some of his energy and his community and his teachings and uh, he's not here anymore. So I feel like it's so special that you were able to have that experience. And I would love to hear a little bit about how that portion of your life was like compared to the rest of the world, for instance, like what are some of the main things that still stand out to you from that part of your life? Yeah, thank you. And, and, and very well put there also, like, you know, I feel, um, well, for me, it was, it was incredible to get to have this experience in my life. And it's really sort of because I was young, it really became like my early conditioning in a way I realized through the years afterwards, how much that actually affected me in a way that I never lived in the normal world very much, but I came from kind of being young into that world of, of Sanyas and, um, mm-hmm. and fell in love with his people, you know, because I arrived to his ashram the same year that he left his body. Okay. So I didn't actually get to meet him in person, but I was on my way there for quite a while and, you know, things don't always happen as quick as you want so he ended up leaving his body in January uh, 1991 I believe it was and mm-hmm. I got there I think in August and um, and it was an incredible time I mean what he said also was that he dissolved himself into his people and it was literally that feeling it was like such an incredible energy in that place you know it varied from about 500 people in the monsoon to many thousands in the high season and Mm -hmm. uh, everything was about you know meditation and personal development very deep work and it was Mm -hmm. like this uh this cocoon where you could really just sort of dive in and explore and and it was an incredible time to be alive you know i really um you know i really had an opportunity to try a bit of everything that was on offer there and um and uh, the deeper messages, you know, was really around, really around the meditation and really about, like you're saying, dismantling the conditioning that we get with us through society in our upbringing and really questioning all of that and, and freeing ourselves from everything that holds us back. And, you know, he had incredible embodiment methods through his his active meditations and that was amazing work because it was not just about sitting you know in some kind of lotus position and and be sort of peaceful but it was really full-on emotional release work a lot of breathing catharsis letting go shedding and and just breaking through layers which you know oftentimes was like really extremely powerful you know like we go through stages sometimes there's like my god I don't know what's happening you know but it was such a safe place in that Buddha field like it was always people around always the older people and it was like you were always held in a way in that safe place so Mm -hmm. um and then I went on to live in the commune Osho's commune in Italy which is like a little sister commune which is the oldest of Osho's communes in in Europe, been there for a very long time as well, which was also absolutely incredible. And I was there for four years. So um, yeah, I was really immersed with with Osho's people and this work for for several years. And Mm. um, yeah, very grateful, very grateful for that. I can feel, I can can feel the energy imprint that he left on earth just by bringing him into the conversation with you. I just, I personally believe that he lived on, in such a different like dimension because he was, from my own personal perspective, was that he was so highly evolved that he was just like in a different reality. And I don't think that a lot of people can really understand that. And it's really easy to judge things that you don't know, but one of the things that has stood out to me is that in everything that I have seen come out about him, I have never once seen anyone from his communities say anything bad about him, Mm. ever. 
And that speaks volumes to me that everyone just is filled with so much love about him. I don't have to understand everything that goes on in you know the communities, but the amount of love that everybody just was co constantly radiates mm -hmm. about him and and from being around his influence, that is basically all I need to know about who he actually was. Mm -hmm. How do the people feel about him? And it, it seems like he was a really beautiful, powerful influence and really helped a lot of people heal and find themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he had a, he was like in his position where he was not of this world or the other. It's like he he could be in between and see and understand. Like he could understand the East, you know, and the people from the, uh, you know, their culture. He could understand the Westerners. He could see mm -hmm. that not necessarily the same methods would work. So he had different mm -hmm. methods for Asians and with different methods for people from the West because he could see that in our psyche we needed different things, you know. And uh, and he was amazing, you know. He was just so um, so no bullshit kind of thing, you know. It was not uh, it, because very often I, what I've noticed is like when you get into these things, it's very easy to get caught up in uh, in traditions and scriptures and and kind of the knowledge, the theory about it all. And yeah. and Osho was so not like that. Like yeah, he would speak on the you know big scriptures and ancient mystics and things, but he would always have a way of just really cutting through to the essence of things and, and never be caught up in the in the in the words and the details, like you know, on a mental level. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I feel it's um it's really where I come from also the way I love to work with this it's very intuitive it's very much from my own direct experience like I, I sometimes call myself like a freestyle tantric because I'm I'm so not scriptured I don't even know mm -hmm. the scriptures honestly very much at all but I feel that my my own understanding is is where I draw from with this and 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 exploring along the way of that and that's where I feel is where we all have access to this intuitive ancient knowledge and it's not about learning a specific technique but it's about really tapping into the place where we have access to infinite knowledge on these topics and mm -hmm. allow ourselves to be the channel like Osha would say that, you know, we don't need the churches and the mosques, you know. Right. You can have your own direct connection with God. You don't need a temple and the priests in between you and the divine. Totally. So, uh, yeah, that's, you know, where I come from with this, that, you know, to in help, you know, inspire everyone to find their own connection and, and their own unique flavor of expressing the divine through them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really don't feel like you can like genuinely feel the connection if you don't feel it inside, like not outside. You have to be able to connect it inside and you don't have to be in a certain place to do it. You just have to be willing to listen and sit and be present with yourself because we're always connected. It never goes away. It's just how much are you in tune with it? Um, yeah. Gosh, I can't even imagine what it was like to live in an entire community that was dedicated to personal development. That <laughs> just sounds just so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what what is that like? What is that like to be surrounded by just everyone that's like on the same page and like really wants to, you know, walk the path of mastery? Like I, I, I just, I feel like, I feel a desire to experience that, to, to have, be surrounded by a, a community that's like, wants to do all of the things to like develop themselves. And I can only dream of what that's like because I've never experienced it. And I oftentimes have felt very unsupported on my own journey. Like, I feel like a lot of awakened souls do because we don't have that community. Like, that's got to give you something nothing else can, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think, you know, people are still very much drawn to finding out, you know, there's lots of different 
ways to connect in community around the world you know if that's you know if that's what we're drawn to do and for me that was you know amazing years both in india and in italy um mm -hmm. and when i worked in the commune in in italy you know there was a lot of uh practical daily life work as well it was like a hard sort of working community uh mm -hmm. and uh but whenever there was a time like you had some kind of personal struggle like i remember when uh the relationship ended with with this man that i was with you know and it was also around the time when my dad died back in sweden and uh and uh, you know they they noticed that like the you know the the elders in the commune noticed that i was having a hard time and they were like hey come and do this come and do this workshop mm -hmm. so you know you could take whatever you were going through straight into you know really going deep with it you know i remember cleaning the bathrooms and crying as i did or gardening and crying as i did mm -hmm. and then i went and did like you know a heart group workshop in the evening and just got you know held by mm -hmm. you know the community and and that was really 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 precious and something that um I when I left from there and um, after you know four years that I lived there and came to Australia in the beginning that was hard because I was used to always have the community around me you mm. don't have to pick up the phone because everyone is there you yeah. know so that took a while of like whoa is this like the real world okay so you have to kind of ring people and kind of you know so so that took a while to adjust but in saying that I mean the where I live now since the last 26 years is, is also a bit of a Buddha field. We mm. call it the rainbow region in, in Byron, around Byron Bay in Australia. So this is also a very alternative bubble. So yeah. uh, still surrounded in some ways, definitely. That's beautiful. That sounds like such a healing and supportive environment. I feel like most people just feel like they process their struggles on their own and, and that having a community to surround you while you're going through something so challenging has probably got to help you process it a lot more healthily and fully in the moment while you're going through it so you're not storing it as trauma because you can't process it you know like to be held by a community just feels like it would make all the difference so I'm so grateful that you had that experience now. I get to talk to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, we can keep recreating this all through life, wherever we are, you know, because I don't, yeah, we were never designed to live like separated in, in, in cities, you know, it's, that's that's not our, in, you know, in our DNA, it's it's about connection and tribe and, and support. Yep. So. You know, if we don't have that in our natural environment, then I think that's the challenge to keep creating that. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I feel like there's a, a lot of people around the world that are feeling the intuitive call to start building communities again, because, you know, that's what the Western world has evolved out of. And that's yeah. one of the biggest sources of suffering for a lot of people is because we don't have communities. So, yeah. I love that you you have the vision of us being able to you know recreate it and and to have people who have genuine experience in what is required to successfully live in a communal type setting because that comes with its own dynamic of challenges also when you're living around a bunch of humans and absolutely yeah it's got to be just a huge opportunity for growth yeah. for everyone right yeah yeah okay Absolutely. let me just glance at my questions really quick i usually don't get to very many of them but um ba, ba, ba. okay we already went over that i wonder i know you already mentioned that partner that made a huge difference for you um who was naturally tantric what have been, what's like one of the biggest challenges that you faced with your own sexual energy in your life? Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you can take a second to think about it. 
<laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, first comes to mind is maybe that I was a late starter, you know. As, as a teenager, I didn't have boyfriends and uh, I was often feeling a bit sort of androgynous. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, for a while I thought, oh, I'll probably never have a boyfriend or something, you know, like when you're teenagers, you can think a lot of things. But I was very slow in, uh, <clears throat> in taking that step. And um, and I think that that in some ways was good the way it worked out for me because I didn't have early bad experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but I was actually almost 22 years old when I had sex the first time. Oh. And um, and I basically pretty much from the very start, uh, it, that was very close to when I met this man in. Mm -hmm. in Wow. By the way, yeah, I had a couple of, of shorter things before, but they were also with men, they were kind of a bit on the journey, you know, mm. conscious and, and loving. So I feel like I've had good experiences from the start. And, um, and I think that makes a big difference because I think a lot of women get exposed to sex that isn't great and they think yep. they may have to do it. And, and the more we, <laughs> yeah, well, that is, it's more common than not by the sounds. You know. Yeah, of kind of going through having sex in a way that is, it's not really meeting you where you're at, but you kind <laughs> of, and all this pressure on maybe being in a certain way for the guy, but, you know, men and women we have very different in a way how can i put this so in the the mainstream culture you know sex that we get exposed to is kind of designed by men for men based on the mm -hmm. male arousal model so that's mm -hmm. kind of how we exposed to sex and for women we don't actually fit into that but very often we try to because it's like that seems to be the only thing available you know you're with a man who uh, hasn't learned ejaculation mastery, but it's very focused on orgasm. It's quick sex. Mm -hmm. So women get forced to try and fit into that and also be quickly aroused and, and, and quick to have orgasm to try and kind of make the most of it as, you know, little as it lasts kind of thing, you know. Yeah. And, and that seems to be the way it looks like for a lot of people, whereas the way you know i've come to understand this is so important that the men learn to work with their sexual energy so that they can actually um go with the woman yes on her arousal wave which is has infinite capacity to go higher and higher and higher whereas the male arousal curve is like that you yeah. know sharp up and quick decline yeah but when we learn to work with the energy, you know, both men and women can go in this way where you go higher and higher and higher together. And that's where you start to discover just new dimension of, dimensions of sexual experience that becomes when the sexual energy leaves the, the base, you know, areas, the base chakras and start to go higher, it starts to connect to the higher energy centers and, and you really expand the energy in very different ways than when it just remains purely raw sex energy. Yep. Uh, but for most people, they, they stay in that first kind of level of sex. But when you start to extend lovemaking and, and refrain from early ejaculation and, and orgas orgasm focus, you can start to open up to new levels of sexual experience that's not just sexual anymore, but it's connected to compassion and love and insight and clarity and cosmic and spiritual dimensions that are so nourishing and, and revitalizing as, expo um, as opposed to the first level sex, which is just purely, you know, sex energy, quick release, you feel relaxed afterwards, but maybe also a bit depleted, maybe also a bit emotional, yeah. you know, it's not deeply fulfilling. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So where did I start with that? <laughs> oh, that was with my own sensitivity. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So for myself, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so for myself, I feel in a way that on that level, I'm, I've had very little trauma, which I feel very grateful for. Yeah. I've had traumas in other ways. I do have trauma around my heart that I'm still working on. 
Mm. But as for the sexual experience, I feel like I was just sort of coming through in a very, very easy way because I was just fortunate to have, you know, that early relationship and and haven't really had bad experiences. So in that sense, I feel that that's also helping me in the work I do because uh, I don't get triggered in the way a lot of women do because they have been so wounded. Mm -hmm. And I don't I don't have that kind of charge or, or, or judgment that's easily happen because we've been through bad things. Yeah. So in that way, I feel like I'm, I can be kind of um, um, quite objective in the way that I, I can approach this and, and work with my clients. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so for myself, um, I feel that it's, it's uh, something that There's, there's stuff there as well for me, you know, there's, there's also deep things that there's still to explore for sure. Like now I've been single for a long time. So with my next lover, I know there's going to be new layers and levels to explore and heal and let go for myself as well. Mm. But as a whole, I feel like, yeah, I feel like I've been lucky in the way that I've somehow managed to escape, you know, yeah. trauma and, and heavy handed sort of conditioning in this when it comes to sexuality. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice to hear that somebody has had that experience because I don't know very many women who haven't had uh, just not the best experiences when it comes to sex. Because like you said, yeah. that's, that's more often than not. So it's really refreshing to hear that there's women out there that don't have all of that trauma that comes with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. even if you do, even the people that do, you know, there's definitely, and I mean, I see examples of that, of women who have had a rough start, but, mm -hmm. you know, they have, you know, dived in and, and, and done work and, and managed to start to offload, you know, layers and start to connect with their, with their natural um, sensitivity again, you know, um, for example, um, uh, this, um, Bonnie Bliss, I don't know if you know of her, she works with women and she lives in my area. Mm -hmm. uh, she mentions also, you know, that that sensitivity and pleasure is trained. And, and quite mm -hmm. often if we've been through trauma and, and learn to shut down emotions, uh, it can feel like we're numb and that we don't have mm -hmm. the sensitivity. And, and quite often women um, will have that belief like, oh, I just don't feel much through penetration or, you know, I only like sex this way because otherwise mm -hmm. I don't feel anything. And that yeah. it's not like a, a definite or, or permanent thing. It's just that somehow there's been a shutdown. And if mm -hmm. we work with that, we can open up that sensitivity again and, and discover incredible levels of, of ability to experience pleasure mm. and, and sensitivity and aliveness that everything is there like nothing's missing in the body it's mm. just that you've had to shut down because of things that happen so that's the work of kind of offloading and, and, and opening up in a way that is um you know respectful towards ourselves, that we're not pushing or forcing you know um, mm. but, but very gently you know unwinding the layers of of protection that we built up because we didn't have another choice. Mm. Yeah. I'm really glad that you touched on that. Mm. I personally feel like that's one of the biggest uh, challenges for women, including myself, is, is learning how to be gentle with yourself and not push or force or override because that is so deeply ingrained in us to not actually be in tune with the wisdom of our body yeah it's it, it's totally multi-layered and i think it definitely takes some time but it was really nice to hear you say that it's all there and it, the potential for you to restore your sensitivity yeah. is totally possible for anybody yeah. if you're willing to dive in and do the work yeah good to hear <laughs> Yeah, and, and, you know, there's so much to discover, you know, it's like we have this universe inside our bodies that very often we might have just sort of tapped into to some extent, but there's there's mm -hmm. always more, you know, 
and yeah. that's what I find is this journey never ends, which is so amazing. You know, there's deeper and higher and, and vaster in every direction mm-hmm. available, you know. Yeah. yeah. And we don't, we will never really tap into that if we stay at that surface level, quick sex. Like you've got to be able to really expand your capacity to explore and feel more and it just sounds so totally transcendental to to shift from you know just like the carnal desire and just keeping your sexual energy in your lower chakras as opposed to learning how to open and expand like I don't think you can probably really put into words how much it can transform your life you have to experience it right yeah exactly like with everything, these things, this, you got to experience it. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I just have probably just one more question before we wrap, wrap up here, because your, your work is focused um, towards men, which uh, anybody who's interested in checking out her website, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, authenticitycoaching.com. I just really loved the way that you put everything together and how you understand the way that men think about women and how they approach them. And um, I would definitely recommend checking it out. But I would love to ask you what one of the biggest challenges that you have seen working with men is when it comes to this type of work. Well, first of all, I think for most men, it's that they not not yet quite there or willing to look at it but there's so much conditioning around kind of having to have it all together and mm. and stigma around needing to know and 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 pride for not asking for help and mm. and uh and and fear of not being good enough and you know the ideas around having to perform um and having to be successful and I think that is probably preventing most men from even looking at this you know and um, because the guys that are you know with the willingness to you know to to look and, and find out you will find you know if you put the energy into finding out then there's um, there's so much to discover and and it doesn't need to take a lifetime either like Mm -hmm. in in very short time you can really turn things around in in a completely different direction and start to open Mm -hmm. the doors to you know the mystery that you have within you but it's that first step of actually even going like is this for me, you know, where I think most guys are still not looking. Yeah. They, 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 I think they may be drawn to, how to put this, I think a lot of men are still drawn to the visuals and, the, you know, and, and they're so mesmerized by the beauty of the feminine and, and all that, you know, the enticing parts that yeah. they kind of get lost in that and they want kind of a beautiful tantric woman to kind of come and do it to him and, and then he will be all <laughs> healed and, and everything will work. But as in actually taking responsibility for himself and go, I'm going to do this work, even if I have to do it by myself and there's no mm-hmm. woman to do it for me, you know, I yeah. will still do it. That's the kind of attitude that you need to make the change because you know a lot of guys still come and say like well look I'd like to do this but I don't have a partner so I can't work on my sexuality and I'm like you don't need a partner to work on this this is your own personal work you can start straight away in fact that's I see that as much preferable because that's when you have the time you know in between relationships to actually focus on yourself so that when you meet your next partner you've already developed Mm -hmm. them in a awareness of of your energy and your body and and how that yeah. all works together yeah i feel like it, it's it's important to have time with yourself especially to explore and work on your sexual energy especially for a man before you 
even like come to the bedroom, you've got to be able to like start mastering that on your own, you know, because as soon as the woman comes in, you're like, you got to have a little bit of experience. It's all 10x. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You think about like, like some men, like you said, just being totally mesmerized by the feminine uh, the beauty of her and and just like just getting lost in like that maiden archetype when that's only one aspect of the feminine and there's a lot of other serious depth to the feminine that you've got to like really be able to like show up for because it's going to call you out on all of your shit and like like make sure that you're worthy and like doing your own work and responsible enough to handle all of her like it's not just the beautiful maiden it's like you got to be able to you know face the dark goddess also and not just the the beautiful flowers on the top you know yeah Yeah. (laughs) and and that's you know then intrinsically linked to him being able to really accept and acknowledge every single part of himself you know Mm -hmm. Every single part inside of him, which is, you know, not what we present to the world, but actually really looking at uh, connecting with his own feminine, connecting with his own inner child and connecting with his rage and his fear and and, and vulnerability and, and all of that, you know, that we can't just take one and ignore the rest, you know, mm-hmm. it's like either all or otherwise you kind yeah. of just have a superficial experience and that's where i think more and more you know of the younger generation are coming with uh, much more courage and Mm. and readiness which is amazing to see you know when that's happening and 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 so inspiring yeah and that's where this kind of you know that that collective how things can spread collectively i feel is is very inspiring even though there's so much like you say work to do that yeah. feeling, you know, that kind of hundred monkey sort of um, yes. thing. It's like I feel that it, it'll get to that, you know, tipping point where you know so much of the younger people are getting this. Yeah, and, and then it's like we're changing the tides, you know, we're changing the trajectory of our collective future. Thank yeah. goodness for that, because we weren't heading in the right direction for a minute. <laughs> no, <we're> not. <laughs> yeah. So I would go as far as to say that one of, uh, in addition to everything you said, which I'm so glad that you brought that up, because when it comes to talking about sexuality, especially in a sacred way, it's the the sex piece is such a only one little piece of it. You like it's it's big work. It's deep. You've got to be able to really, like you said, love and and accept, you know, all parts of yourselves. And I think that kind of goes overlooked, especially in the mainstream thought of Tantra, it's not just yeah. sex, it's so much more than that. And uh, like a path to liberation basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so one of the biggest things that that is an issue is uh, premature ejaculation. And that's one of the things that you specialize in helping kind of uh, mentor and like unravel out of men right when you work with them that's one of the like a big piece that you work on right yeah and if uh, if i remember correctly you have what is it an an ebook that you're offering the audience yeah or... it's an ebook for men okay is yep. it is it about that like lasting longer in bed uh, it's it's about? got it's the five keys to sexual mastery for men. So it's okay. basically um, the foundations for the way that I work with men. And those five keys, only one of them is just sexuality. But okay. that piece on its own, it's usually not landing if the other pieces aren't there. So that's why I really wanted to bring that in because I feel like you don't see that very much, um, and and that easily gets missed you know you kind of you want to st- jump straight to the the sexy sort of exciting parts but mm-hmm. you know, your ability to to connect with your inner peace your inner stillness and your presence for example mm-hmm. as a man yeah. is um, 
is first of all super important for himself because that's what's going to help him hold um, his sexual power and potency that you know wild passionate hot energy uh, if you don't have that deep inner peace then that kind of just will run you you know it'll take over and that's where you know premature ejaculation and and those things kind of just go rampant so that is such an important piece in in building that inner anchor of really mm -hmm. solid inner presence which also then happens to be it seems the quality that the feminine desires the most in the men is his ability to be present and yeah. to be here with her yeah. and that's often forgotten because the guys they they're sort of being conditioned to think that it's all about uh his performance you know yeah. where if you can bring the presence Mm -hmm. You've already got such an incredible start. And from there, whatever you do with presence is mm -hmm. pretty much going to be amazing, you know, when you bring that quality to it. So, uh, you know, we go into those aspects and the full body embodiment in really connecting with the whole body. Because very often we compartmentalize, you know, there's the guys usually focus on the on the sexual organs, but maybe not so present in the rest of the body. Yeah. So really about coming home into the whole body, because when we can trust the body, the body knows, you know, the body can really lead the way and show us which is the next best position and movement. And we don't have to think, oh, should I try this? Should I try that? But you can trust your body. It's amazing what the body can do when we really are in, in connection with that universal flow. It's just, it's magical. It's like yeah. a, a magic dance. I mean, I like to um, refer to like the birds that fly in formation in the sky. You know, they, they just know how to do that because mm -hmm. they're connected. And we also know how to make love beautifully when we really connected and at home in our own bodies and mm -hmm. connect to that divine flow. So a lot of the work is about that, you know, really learning to connect to what we already have. And when you combine that with your sexual energy and, and learn to work with that in a way that's not about the release, it's not about the, the peaks, but about bringing the whole energy up into the body and really embody that energy. Mm -hmm. So the book is a lot about that. Um, and it does go into the foundations for sex energy mastery. It's not a full guide. It doesn't go into all the details, but it gives a really good foundational understanding of how you can work with this energy if you want to start mm -hmm. to evolve and, and turn things around. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then there's the other ebook for for women, which is specifically geared towards women who want to help their man to last longer in bed and how you can support him if you are with a man who struggles to last mm -hmm. and that uh, you know you can do so much to help him there as a woman so that's that's the other one it sounds so valuable thank you so much for sharing that with the audience i'm sure they're oh gonna, so welcome oh, and um so you have a program called Kings to the Kingdom, is that right? The Keys to the Kingdom. Keys yeah. to the Kingdom, it's so yeah. brilliant. And that's where you go more more in depth into some of the concepts that are introduced in the ebook, correct? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there we go fully into it. Yeah, that's every just, single part. It, it really feels like a, a program that is just made of gold. I, I really feel your the embodiment and energy that you put into birthing that for the world that it feels like a good program thank you thank you yeah it's developed over the years you know and and sort of like parts have moved around a bit but in in essence it's sort of what came to me early on in the picture and it's sort of remained that I mm -hmm. uh, just keep sort of adjusting and refining and, and learning more you know layers and more depths to it yep. but yeah that's the journey that my one-on-one -on -one male clients go on uh, okay. it's, it's um, seven weeks in total, but it's six modules. The seventh week is just for integration. Beautiful. Yeah. And so that's the journey that, like, if um, if a man wants to come to you and inquire about one-on-one -on -one coaching, that's the journey that you would have him go on. And you 
support them with private sessions also or how does that work? yeah yeah it's private sessions uh and there's also learning and study modules so that because there's a lot of work for them to integrate in their daily life and we don't necessarily do that during the session time so the time right. in the session is free to explore whatever it's you know each person needs so so we, it's not a content sort of spewing thing you know the session but it's really open to explore and then and then there's the self practices which is um you know for those number of weeks it's um that's what makes the difference really you know to put in to create his own you know sacred practice daily mm -hmm. practice uh is what really makes the difference yeah, yeah. i can imagine it sounds great <laughs> sounds very <laughs> All right, Nichelle, well, this has been such a beautiful hour with you. Thank you so much for your time, for everything you've Thank shared. You so I can't wait to release this to everyone, and I will be sure to include um, links for your ebooks for them and your website in case anybody wants to get a hold of you. Yeah. And yeah, just thank you so much. I'm so in honor of the beautiful woman that you are. and this so needed powerful work that you're doing in the world thank you for being on the planet with us right now oh thank you oh you're so kind likewise like i feel you know immense gratitude towards what you're doing and and really i'm actually i don't know everything about what you're doing but i can see that you're an incredible magnet in in pulling people together and and that's like without that we might just be isolated you know on the planet and and not connected so that's such an important work you're doing in in connecting people and bringing this to the world in such a beautiful um you know extraordinary brilliant way so yeah. thank you so thank much you. yeah thank you so much. yeah we're making, we're building a web making a web around the planet yeah with light and yeah wisdom, so all right well thank you for tuning in everybody thank you Nitya. and i hope everybody enjoyed the episode and i will see you for the next one aloha <laughs>